Amen. If you have your Bibles, look at Acts chapter 15, verse 19. I want to talk about something that I think I've only ever t- spoke on once in my entire ministry. And, uh, and, and it, it's, it's not one of those subjects that's uh, easily preached. Uh, it's more of a talk and, and, and sharing and some thoughts on my mind about this. But I want to talk to us about the whole subject of hospitality. Now, th- we're, we're coming up on a time in Thanksgiving and Christmas when probably you will be hosting uh, family members or friends over at your house. And you, you know how you do. You, you want to make the best impression and you want to make um, everybody feel absolutely welcome to your house when they come. And so you, uh, you, you, you do things that you normally don't regularly do. And so you, maybe the, the house gets an extra cleaning or whatever the case might be and you decorate and you do all those kinds of things in order to make your guests feel extra special whenever they come over to your house. Well, the same thing is true. We are a family as a church, as a community. We are a family. And so we, when our guests come and our guests are visitors, whenever they come, we want to, to welcome them in a very special way. And so I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. Just one verse here in verse 19 out of chapter 15 It says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, you know the whole background between Jews and Gentiles. Jews had nothing to do with Gentiles. They wouldn't sit across the table with them and have have dinner with them. They wouldn't fellowship with them in any way. Gentiles were unclean, and so they stayed away from Gentiles. But here, God was really making it very much known to the Jerusalem church that he was bringing salvation to the Gentiles. And so he, he makes a statement here that we are not to make things difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. You remember in Jesus' time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were a group of religious leaders who were not helping people get to God. They were actually hindering people to get to God. They made it difficult for people to get to God. They, they, they made coming to the temple a very difficult experience for them. And so here he, he mentions in, very, in a very strong way, we don't want to make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Jesus was constantly playing to the consumer instincts of the crowd. And think about this for a minute. It wasn't necessarily always because of his teaching or his preaching. Oftentimes, they didn't fully understand what he was talking about. The disciples who followed him every day for three and a half years didn't always fully understand what he was teaching on. But Jesus, or people flocked to Jesus because he healed them, and he fed them, and he comforted them, and they came because of of what he was able to do for them and in meeting a need that they had in their hearts. And so... In our setting, and when, and when church setting, whenever a visitor or a guest decides to come, they decide the information and the, the data that has been checked over and over again, they decide to come to church and they decide whether or not they are going to return in the first seven to ten minutes. First seven or ten minutes. So it isn't even necessarily the, the, the message or the music or any of those kinds of things. There's other indicators that for the first time when someone shows up at our doors, they are looking at and they are looking to see whether that's going to be welcome. Now, that starts from the very beginning. They pull into the parking lot and, and they, they might not find an easy parking place. And they're already nervous, if you remember the first time you came to a, a new church, they're already nervous about being there. They don't know anybody there. And so they pull into the parking lot, can't find, they can't find an easy parking space. So maybe even at that point, they decide, you know what, we're going to turn around. We're going to go back home we're, we're gonna, or we're going to try somewhere else. If they can't find signage to get easily into the building, it becomes even more difficult. And so every single one of those situations makes it harder and harder from them, for them to overcome that in order to be our guest for the very first time. So Pastor Charles Stanley writes, we must remove every possible obstacle from the path of the disinterested, the suspicious, the here against my will person, would rather be somewhere else person, 
and all of our unchurched guests. The parking lot, the hallways, the sanctuary must be obstacle-free zones. And so the idea of welcoming and bringing hospitality to our guests is the idea of removing all of the things that normally bring anxiety or an anxious feeling to come into a new place. And so one of the reasons we, we have a connection team is to help alleviate those, those fears. And so they, the idea is to lead them to wherever they need to go. If they need to find restrooms when they come in, do that. If they have children and they, have, they want to know where the children's areas are, remember, this is a very, a, a very <laughs> scary moment for a lot of people that are coming in for the very first time. And so in the Greek language, the, hospi the word hospitality is a combination of two distinct words and concepts. The very first word is phileo, means brotherly love. And the second word, xenos, means stranger. So the, you put the two together, it's giving brotherly love to a stranger. Now, maybe a lot of the people that you're going to invite over for Thanksgiving and Christmas aren't complete strangers. They might be family, but it's showing brotherly love to whoever you, you, you invite over. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 through 34 says, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you. You shall love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. I, I, I guess I never really paid attention much to this subject, but I was really amazed at how many scriptures deal with hospitality in the word of God. In fact, he doesn't leave it as an option for us. He gives it to us as a command. And so in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby... Some have entertained angels unawares. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So, and just by the very um, scripture there, there is work involved in hospitality, always, always. There is preparation, there is inconvenience, there is all of those kinds of things that is always involved in hospitality. And so he says here to show hospitality without grumbling like man I got all got these people coming my family's coming over I got to work all this stuff and prepare all this food and do all this kind of stuff because my family's coming over he says do it without grumbling Romans 12 13 says contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality it's over and over again I I just pulled it up just just recently on in Google there was 14 pages of of Bible verses that dealt with hospitality. God wants us to be hospitable to the people that God brings our way. So when we receive a gift and we're going into the Christmas season, how do we receive it? Do we lay it aside and it collects dust in the corner? We never open it. We never, we just say, you know, some, at some point, Next year, I'll get an opportunity maybe to open this gift and see what is actually inside of it. Or do we say, no, this is precious. You open it right away. You enjoy the gift as it is presented. Do we thank the person who gave us the gift? So as a church, we receive gifts all the time. They're called visitors. They're God's gift to us. So how do we receive those gifts? Do we show the person, the, the giver of those gifts, appreciation? How do we treat the gifts that we've been given? And how do we welcome them in a way that they come back again? There's a word that they use in the whole process of welcoming visitors, and it is the word they, call, they say, assimilation. And basically, assimilation is the process used to encourage first-time guests to continue coming back. I don't know in your story of, of how you got saved or whether you got saved in a church or through an individual or through a crusade or whatever that happened, but I doubt it's the first time that you heard the gospel that you necessarily gave your heart to Jesus. It might have been two times or three times or four times that you heard the gospel presented to you and then your heart was softening. It was, it was like what the scripture talks about, the hammer to the rock. It was beginning to break down all the defenses that we have against Jesus in the first place. 
And so when a visitor comes in, if they're unsaved, they're unchurched, it isn't necessarily the very first time that they come in to this sanctuary that they are going to get saved. And so you want them to keep coming. You want them to come back. You want more opportunities for the Holy Spirit and the presence of God to deal with their hearts. And so that first time becomes very critical on whether or not they are able to come back, we are able to have them back a second time. It usually takes many visits for a person to give their hearts to the Lord. So our job is to do the very best job that we possibly can to make sure that they come back a second time. God is concerned about numbers. Now, you might say, no, 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 he's not really all that concerned. Um, there is a healthy way to look at numbers, and there is an unhealthy way to look at numbers. If everything that, that you're going for in, in, in the sense of a church is all about numbers, the offering, the number of attendants, all of that, that can be a very unhealthy way of looking at numbers. But there's a healthy way to look at numbers that God gives you. First of all, God entitled a book called Numbers. So he must, be, he must be a little bit interested in numbers. There were 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. Now, I, the first thought that comes to my mind, like who in the world was the guy that counted all them? You know, you're, there, I mean, there's a lot happening on the day of Pentecost. There's people that are, that are speaking in, in other tongues, and, and the people that are hearing them are hearing some of those tongues in their own language. There's a lot going on. Peter stands up to preach, and he preaches a powerful message, and 3,000 people give their hearts to the Lord. Now, who's counting? Now, who's watching for that? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit just say there, there was a lot of people that got saved that day? It makes a note, a very, a very specific note, that 3,000 got saved. So, if, for instance, if, if Mike and Nikki took the youth group to youth convention and they took 20 youth with them and they came back and all the parents were here to pick up their youth and there was only 17 and three youth are missing somewhere. And you go, but, but numbers aren't important. I mean, it's like, it's not, numbers are not a big deal. To the parent that's missing their child, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Three parents, or if they're whatever family that's from, they're missing their kids. So numbers are important because they're about people. And to God, people matter. So a church that is interested in reaching the lost needs to be growing. And God will send gifts that he is going to enable that church in order to do what they need to do and to have them return. So a healthy ratio of first-time visitors to regular attenders is 5 to 100. 3 to 100 is a church that is just maintaining. They're in maintenance mode. They're not really growing at all. Five in a hundred is, is a steadily growing church. Seven in a hundred becomes a rapidly growing church. So three in a, out of a hundred is the minimal number of guests that any church needs just to maintain the numbers that they have right now. People move away. They, they go to other churches. They go on to be with the Lord. A lot of things happen over the space of time in the, in, the, in the congregation. So if a church has 100 visitors a year and only five of those start regularly attending, that means one in 20 visitors stays. Isn't that incredible? One in 20 visitors stays, but that's a steadily growing church if that happens. What happened to the rest of all those other people, the other 19 of those visitors that came. That's the job that the church has. So biblical hospitality is something that God is very interested in. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. So preparation is essential to any successful endeavor. The old saying goes, if you plan, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so there, everything about church is so much preparation involved in it. 
for example, for a typical sermon um, on, you know, on whatever day, on Wednesday or on Sunday, usually takes anywhere from five to eight hours for preparation. You, you have to bring the material together, you study, you, 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 you add your illustrations. All of those kinds of things have to be done for the preparation of a, of a sermon. The music part of the service takes hours of practice before practice, music schedules have to be made up. The music is pulled for each musician. It takes hours to hunt down a new song and find the sheet music that, that goes with the key that the team can work with. Um, all of that takes tons of time. Children's workers spend hours preparing and planning their service for the kids. Now, it's one thing to hold kids' interest for one time. But doing it week after week after week after week takes a lot of creativity. I mean, you've got to do a lot of praying to hold their interest from week to week and keep the message on, on, on target. And so there, there's a lot of preparation involved. There is cleaning that is done and preparation of the building and keeping the, the building maintained and light bulbs and all of those kinds of things that have to be constantly kept after in order to plan for a service. So what do we do to plan to receive guests? If someone is coming over to your house for dinner, you, as I said, make all kinds of preparations for that. Maybe the extra cleaning, do whatever you have to do, the preparations for the meal, the preparations, how you're de decorating, how you're going to set your plates out, all those kinds of things. That preparation has to be done ahead of time. So there is a process and a plan that has to be put in place for guests to come to a church. You treat, you want to treat them with the best hospitality that you possibly can. So the church is a family that we're expecting guests to come. I don't know, I don't know how many of you have ever been um, to a nicer hotel or resort or um, anybody? Two of you, one, one three. <laughs> um, by accident, um, and I can't even think of the name of it now. It's up on forty. Um, yeah, yes, Nemecolon. The district had us booked there for a retreat, and um, in the in the process, a large corporation came in and wanted a big block of rooms. So they had originally taken taken all of the penthouses, all the really fancy suites. Um, they had taken them all, and but it wasn't enough of a block. So when they came in, they said, "We can give you a whole block of rooms, but it's it's a downgrade of rooms from what you would have had." So they gave the district presbyters all the the uh, penthouse suites, all of those kinds of things. So we we Darla and I get there, and you know when I I'm almost a little bit uncomfortable with anything that's you know above my pay grade kind of a thing when it comes to you know. Um, staying in a resort and you know I, I remember the very first time Darla's uh, work she worked for a doctor and every at every Christmas he would he would charter a bus and take everybody down to Atlanta Georgia and, and do a Christmas show there and then at the the finest hotel that he could he could get in Atlanta he would put everybody up there and I mean they just totally put on the dog for you in every single way and I I was like you know, the first time I went to that, um, the guy stops and he goes, I need your key. You're not getting my key. It's like, what do you want my key for? I need to park your car, sir. You know, it's like kind of, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just, I'm just so out of source with that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, we went to Nemecolon and we got there and we're expecting, you know, the, the district doesn't go high class. So they, they're just very average when they when they book something like that we got there and a guy comes out and he says something like i'm the person that's assigned to you and um so i'll be carrying all your luggage and i'll be be taking you everywhere you go you'll be with me all the time that you're here and um i looked at darla and i go like he must have got us confused with somebody else or something <laughs> something's really wrong and so he's taking all of our luggage and he's taking us up higher and higher and now up and going up in the elevator he says, hey, you guys are going to have um, this little room in the, in the corner of the building. 
but it's going to be it's going to be really nice and it's going to be very intimate for you guys and you'll be very close while you're there and i'm thinking well that's that's kind of what i expected the, the district to do and so he he goes and he opens the door to the place and and no kidding um that hotel room was bigger than our house for, literally <laughs> it was huge big rooms and living room and a dining room and all in a hotel room um Darling and I didn't know how to act. You know, we were just like out of sorts. This, was, this wasn't common to us. But one of the things I noticed is that the detail that they put into hospitality. I mean, every little thing was taken care of, this and that. And I mean, before you even asked for something, they were like ready to, to meet that need. He, that, the guy that was assigned to us, he was just there for every single, absolute, every single thing or wish that we ever wanted. It was incredible to see that kind of service. And, and then when he, he would be beside us whenever um, we were dining or anything, that, I mean, they, this guy was with us all the time, except when we finally shut the door. Um, he, it was just incredible. I, I, I was just astounded at that level of hospitality in order to welcome their guests in a way that they wanted them to come back. But think about that for a moment. We, we are doing... God's business. It is the only eternal business. And so the church should be doing better at hospitality than even the finest resorts. We're welcome, welcoming guests that it is a matter of life and death how we treat them. Luke chapter 16, verse 8, and you remember the story there of, of this shrewd manager that was able to sell off his owner's assets to these, these business people that owed money, he was able to sell them off with a better deal. And the, and the master, uh, the owner of that whole thing comes out, and in Luke chapter 16, he, he's talking about this servant. Now, remember, he's not condoning bad practices, dishonest practices. Never does the Scripture do that. But he does say there in Luke 16, 8, the master commended the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. In so many things in, in how we do things, oftentimes we have a mentality that goes, you know what, this is, this is God. And he's loving and graceful, and he doesn't really care how good of a job you do for him. Big deal. It's God. He understands. He knows we're flawed individuals. But shouldn't the thinking be the opposite of that? That we're doing this for the Lord, and so we're going to do the absolute best job that we know how to do. Not, not just we'll give him anything. David said, I, wouldn't, I will not offer to him something that costs me nothing. We, we are offering our very best unto the Lord when we're talking about church. We're giving him everything. And so it's not, it's not the idea of the Lord. It's you, and you obviously, you, you'll take anything. You'll take the least. You'll take anything else. Our attitude should be, Lord, you know what? We're going to give you our absolute best, the very best that we can offer to you. Businesses spend billions of dollars every single year to make sure that customers return. We're doing God's business. We want to do the very best for what he's called us to do. God has called us to serve others. So in this assimilation process, there are three steps. The first one is to turn a first-time visitor, and you hope as that guest came that they come back again, that they come back a second time. And then turn, secondly, turn a second-time visitor into someone that comes the third time and the fourth time and becomes a regular attender. And then thirdly, to turn a regular attender into a fully devoted follower of Jesus, someone that is absolutely committed to his will and his way and is following Jesus and putting him first, letting him make the choices for them. He's surrendered entirely to the Lord. That's the, the third goal, the absolute goal of every Christian. It has been said, as I said in the beginning, that it takes a visitor 
up to seven to ten minutes to make up their mind whether or not they will return. So obviously the visitor is looking at a number of factors that play into whether or not they're ever going to come back again. They're basing their decision on a whole host of input that comes to their minds. So maybe, look at, just think about how the process is, and maybe the first, if you can remember the first time that you first came, they are looking when they come into the parking lot of the atmosphere that they're in and how easy the access is and all of those kinds of things. The problem is that as family, just as it is with your own house, we often get accustomed to the way things are. So, and I've noticed this at times at different buildings that I've gone into, sometimes you walk into a building and the workers are working there and yet there's this, this smell that smells like dirty diapers or something, you know what I mean? And, and um, I, 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 when, I wear, and when I was working maintenance for JCPenney, uh, we used to get that smell once in a while, and what it was is with the air handlers, the filters had gotten slightly moisture in them, and then that moisture got kind of rancid, and then it just begins to stink through the whole store. And they, and after a while, when you're in that building, you you don't nothing. I mean, even dirty diapers take on a common smell after a while. It's like I don't smell anything. We, it's, it's just the way it is, and you get used to that. But when new eyes come in, they look at things entirely different. They smell things that maybe we don't smell anymore. And so I'm always interested when new people come and say, what was that first experience like? What, what, what did you deal with? I remember when Todd first came, he, um, he couldn't find where the entrance was to our church. So he, he turned on this street up here and he, and he drove by the ramp coming down into the parking lot and went back into the residential neighborhood behind us. And he figured, no, there, there has to be some other way to get into the church because it ends here. It's all residential area. And he came back and he finally figured out that the ramp does come down into the parking lot and that and then the church building is there. But all of those things, you could imagine, if you're nervous about already coming, then it makes it even more difficult. There's an obstacle there that makes it hard for us to be able to, to get through to that point. And, to be, and you have to be determined to say, you know what, even if there are some obstacles, I'm going to visit. Maybe the Lord drew me here, whatever the case is, but I, I've got, I want to visit. And those people eventually do come. But what about the other people that maybe something was an obstacle that stopped them from coming? Maybe... Maybe they looked at the building and it didn't appeal to them, or whatever the case might be. Those first moments are critical. The first contacts are critical. And so kudos to our connection team for being out there and welcoming people with a smile and, uh, and having a positive outlook. You know, that when, I mean, when you come for the very first time to a church, you don't want everybody to be down and gloomy and, oh, boy, serving the Lord is such a torture and all of those kinds of things. You want people that are positive, smiling, bright side of life. They're, they're looking to help you in any way they can, take you to wherever you need to go. They're looking to accommodate you being here for the first time. And so if, we, if there's children, you find you find the children's spaces and you introduce them to the, the children's directors and all of those things, you make it comfortable for them to be here. Worship team, if you get ready to come. I've been praying about this whole subject and, I, and the Lord said to me, I'm gonna send you guests. And, I, and that's, you know, that's the best word you can hear from the Lord. I'm gonna send you guests. But he also said, you've got to be ready to welcome them. So think about this for a moment. The Lord could bring, he could lay on people's hearts all over to crowd this place with visitors. But are we going to be at a place where we're going to be able to welcome them, nurture them, be able to, to provide what God wants 
for those that he's laying on his heart. So remember, he's interested in people. And so if we're not at that place to welcome them and to nurture them, then he's going to say, well, I know some churches that are. I'm going to send them to those churches. And so even though businesses are concerned about this in every single way and they spend millions of dollars in order for this to happen, we as a church have to make it a priority. I can remember so many different bad areas of hospitality that I, I remember in, in different churches that we belong to, I, I remember a couple that their seat was their seat, if you know what I mean. I mean, they could have put their name stamped on it. And I remember a visitor coming in for the first time and sat down in their seat. And they were mad. They told the visitor to get up out of their seat. They always sit there. Fortunately, I don't think that's ever happened at Praise, and I hope it never does. <laughs> but can, imagine, can you imagine the thought of that, that I would not give up my seat for a guest. And so in every way, we, we lay down our preferences and we say, you know what? We want to welcome guests. And so whatever we have to do in order to accommodate them and to welcome them and to make them feel at ease to be able to come into the presence of a holy God, we have to do that. We take those steps. We make special accommodations for the gifts that God will bring us. And when it comes right down to it, the very bottom line of it, this isn't just about welcoming customers to a business. It's about welcoming people to give their hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a matter of life and death. And if we have that one window of seven to ten minutes, maybe on a person that knows nothing about Jesus, we want to make sure every single second of that seven to ten minutes is filled with the grace of God. We are welcoming, that we are wanting to accommodate them so that they can come to know to Jesus that we worship and we sing about. That loving Lord that has done so much in our hearts, we want that to be a part of their lives.